we're good now. Maybe. It says I'm live, but I don't see anything on my screen here, so just bear with me for a second. Mm-hmm. As I'm live. Oh, come on. Why is it doing this to me today? <laughs> like, seriously, Friday. all week it's been working. It says yep. I'm live right now. Okay, looks like I think I'm in, but I don't see yep. video. Okay, I think we're good now. Okay, all right. fantastic. I, everybody will probably trickle in in a minute here. Um, sure. so, uh, if you want to give everybody a couple minutes, I guess we could just talk about what's going on in the news right now before I mm -hmm. introduce yourself. So, uh, how are things out by you? They're pretty good. So we were, so the university was supposed to be on spring break this week and last week, Wednesday, they sent out the announcement that they were going to close campus to classes for a couple of weeks. Um, they've since extended to the rest of the semester. So we're going to finish out our semester doing everything online. Uh, there's going to be no commencement, no anything like that. So I think sad. they'll do maybe a delayed one, but that's you know kind of sad. Yeah, that is super sad for all the people that have gone through. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I'd be super bummed. We're probably in the same boat, though. We're supposed to have graduation, and if they end up uh, canceling school, uh, those poor right. kids are going to be out. They're going to miss out on their uh, – um, their, senior, their the high school things. graduation, which is a which is a big deal. So yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I just had one of my students say we are going on lockdown tonight. So my wife actually mm. just came in and, and gave me the news, but I haven't read it yet. So that's what I've heard. All right. So we haven't heard anything for us yet, but yeah, everything's closed, and we can only do takeout food. Yeah, that's kind of where it was now, but I don't know if that's changed. Um, just for the students that are jumping in, can you guys hear us okay? Can you hear both me and Dr. Perry? I get somebody to just confirm that before we uh, get going. It'll be weird if, like, I'm talking and you guys can hear me, but you can't hear Dr. Perry. Mm-hmm. Caesar, are you there? Can you confirm that? Can you hear me and Dr. Perry? I can say something so you can make sure. There's a little bit of, there's like a 10-second delay when it's streaming. Sure. Yes. Okay. So they can hear us. So cool. uh, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just uh, to get started, could you maybe introduce yourself, what your position is, and uh, tell us what you do? Yeah. So my name is Sarah Perry, and I'm a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, I actually met Mr. Zorn when I was a PhD student at the University of Illinois down in Champaign-Urbana. Um, we both did martial arts together. But um, <laughs> yeah, the photos that get put up by people in my department are fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I work in chemical engineering, which I would say most people don't really have a good sense of what it is. Um, I actually teach one of our freshman courses, the Introduction to Chemical Engineering, and this is something we talk about, because in high school you take math and physics and chemistry, and if you do sort of fun activities, you can build bridges or concrete boats or catapults, there's a lot of mechanical things, and with robotics, people are getting more into electric, electrical engineering, but we don't usually let people play with chemicals as much, so what chemical engineers do is a little bit more obscure. Um, but we make everything happen, right? So if you think about how food is processed, how plastics are made, you know, anything that's a process that involves chemicals or materials, a chemical engineer is involved with that. And so you can really think of us as applied chemists on a really, really big scale. That's pretty awesome. And I just want to correct the record. Um, you said that I met you at the U of I. It was at, or yeah, U of I. It was actually way before that. You know, I was trying to think oh, of this yeah, this yeah, year. Yeah. It was I forgot. 2004. Yeah. So this is going to make you feel really <laughs> old. It's been like 15 or 16 years at this point. Yeah. So at the time, I was at the University of Arizona doing, uh, I guess at that point, a master's degree, but I did my undergraduate at the University of Arizona and a nice. master's there, and then I moved to Illinois, and then Mr. Zorn also is in the Chicago area. 
So I was just trying to think of this uh, this morning. Like, I don't think we actually ever uh, fought each other, right? We never sparred? I don't think so. I was sparring against men and women in the in the region, but it was like the higher ranks. So I had Kelly Shoup and Mate Stavries and all of them. Yeah. So um, just uh, for my students that are watching us in chat, if you want to add, just maybe chime in on this. Who do you think would win in a fight, me or Dr. Perry? Just without knowing anything about either of us, who do you think would win in a fight? We'll give them a second to type that in here. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to some questions about uh, your background. So uh -huh. as long as I've known you, you've always been interested in chemistry. Like at one point in your life, did you realize that you wanted to be a chemist? I don't know. Chemist specifically took a while, um, probably when I had to pick a major in college. But I've always liked science. So mo both of my parents have degrees in science and engineering. My mom has a degree in geology and education. My dad has a degree in geology and electrical engineering. So I've been doing science projects my whole life. Um, when I was in kindergarten, we did one on um, thermal conductivity, right? So if you have cups of, well, you do cold water if you're a kindergartner, but anyway, um, and you put a, you know, a wooden chopstick in one and a plastic straw in another and a metal spoon, right? The metal spoon will feel cold. And that's because of heat transfer. So I, I did all of that really early on. Um, and I really wanted to be an astronaut because going into space would be amazing. Um, but about the time I got into you know, going towards college and everything, the space program was really, really scaled back. And so I decided that I wanted to do basically applied chemistry and decided to do that. So I took undergraduate coursework in both chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, so on a typical work day for you right now, what does your job involve? I know you're teaching. Um, but is there anything else that you do? Do you still do research? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I teach one class a semester. In the fall, when I teach our big freshman introductory class, I teach somewhere between 70 and 100 students. And I have that class three days a week. Um, in the spring, I teach a smaller course, which is for senior undergraduates and graduate students. And it's much smaller. It's about 20 students. Um, and then I run a research group full time. So one of the big things that faculty at universities do is they do research. And I have a, a group of about six PhD students and then a bunch of undergraduates who all do work in my lab. And so I'll have meetings with them about what they've been doing, meetings with collaborators. I will work on writing papers. So we publish the science that we do, not in a lab report, but in an actual paper that would be in a scientific journal. Um, and then I write proposals to try and get money to fund everything. So that, that's actually an interesting thing. If you really like science, and you say, OK, well, going to college is expensive. How do I pay for that? Right? There's student loans, and it's a problem. If you decide that you want to continue on and get a graduate degree, so if you wanted to get a PhD in chemistry, chemical engineering, et cetera, that, you actually get paid to do that. So all of my PhD students get a full stipend, cover their tuition, and they're paid for the four or five years that it takes. So um, I'm actually in a master's program for instructional technology, and they do not pay me. So going yeah, the, si on what you going do. the yeah. science route is probably better because uh, mine yep. is not science-based. So I have to fork over money for that. And it's expensive, especially right now with everything going on. So that's really cool. Um, mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of opportunities out there for students that are just trying to make ends meet with their undergrad, um, especially like my school, Northern Illinois University, which is the closest school for my students uh, in Joliet. So mm -hmm. uh, those of you that are considering science, it's not out of the realm of possibilities for you. Um, right. So what did you like getting to where you are like right now? What would you say you struggled the most with? I, I think I probably you. struggled the most with the fact that science and math in the U.S. are not cool. Right? So here I am. I really think science and math are cool, and nobody else around me agrees. And I think, yeah, <laughs> we see this all over the place, right? What are the examples in, like, TV and the movies where we see science? It's stuff like Big Bang Theory, right, where it's some of the weirdest people ever, or Bones or some of these other CSI shows where there's somebody brilliant, but they're really weird. Um, 
So that was kind of tricky. Um, but otherwise, once you get a group of friends, it's cool. And that, that's something about the university. When you go from high school to university, it's a total change. And so you get to meet new people. And you can build a friend group around the thing that you're interested in. So it looks like most of the students said that you would win in a fight, um, which uh, I would probably agree with. Um, Dr. Perry's actually going for her uh, mastership this year. She just got her sixth degree black belt, which is a, which is a pretty big deal. So she uh, she does outrank me and has pretty much the entire time I've known her. Uh, but she is she's very good at taekwondo. Um, I had a uh, student pop in or student question come up. Um, Caesar wants to know what are your top expectations for students at the beginning of the semester. So if I think about people who come in and start chemical engineering. Um, the thing that is really hard and different about engineering as coursework and everything is that it's complex, right? So if you think about, you take chemistry, you do it, here's a reaction and this is what's going on. Or you're doing math or physics and here's one thing that's happening. What engineers do is they have to deal with systems. And so I don't expect anybody to be good at really complex problems. But, you know, I just want them to be interested and willing to take the risk, ask a question, and, you know, figure it out. So over the course of a semester, people will start feeling totally like they can't handle it and they don't know what's going on because it's very new. It sounds and really familiar. As they, yeah, as long as they persevere, I mean, we're, we're here to help, you know, get everybody through. And I, you know, I'm there, I have a group of six to ten people also associated with the class, graduate students, undergraduates, who all have different venues where people can go for help. I just want to echo that too, like physics is a really hard major, just just as hard if not um, harder maybe. Differently hard. Yeah, yeah. definitely uh -huh. differently hard, I like that, yeah. uh, than chemistry, and I will definitely agree with you on that, that when I was going through undergrad, it was so hard, and the professors are there to definitely support you, so if you pick something that's that's too hard, you can totally get through it if you if you push through and you you just reach out for the help that's there. And the other thing is that you're not expected to do it by yourself. So we really encourage people to work in groups on their homework. You know, there's a difference between working together and copying, right? And if I'm working with three of my buddies on this and maybe I'm really good at this one particular aspect of the math and somebody else is really good at programming and somebody else is really good at chemistry, together we can all figure it out. And that's how jobs work in the real world anyway. You don't have to know it all. That's definitely true. Um, I think a lot of students are, are afraid to take that, that risk and to try things on their own. There's a lot of students that want that hand-holding um, when mm -hmm. they're working through stuff, but you know, it's just like anything in life. You gotta eventually try to do it on your own. So mm -hmm. um, I guess the students don't believe me when I tell them you could totally do this, but it's good to hear that there's a, even at the college level, even at your graduate level, that oh, students yeah. are running into the same problem. Well, people assume that, you know, graduate student, oh, you're so smart and so brilliant and you must know all of this stuff. But the only thing that's different between a graduate student and an undergraduate is about six months worth of time. You know, graduation's cool, but it doesn't magically endow you with knowledge that you didn't have otherwise. So life's always a process and it's, it's much more about learning um, and troubleshooting and problem solving than it is about, you know, knowing the right answer magically. All right, so um, I'm going to move on to some questions about um, school specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of know where you've been, but if you wouldn't mind kind of tell everybody where you went for undergrad and uh, where you got, I know your PhD was through U of I, but maybe just talk about where you went and how you got there. Yeah, so I grew up, I'm originally from Colorado, and I you know, did some school in Colorado. My parents moved a bunch, which is always tricky. So I actually graduated high school in Oregon in the Portland area. And then I did undergrad at the University of Arizona, which is in Tucson. And so there I have undergraduate degrees in chemistry and chemical engineering. And that took me five years, right? So I finished the chemical engineering degree in four years. And I thought I was going to be all cool and finish my chemistry coursework in one extra semester because scholarships are usually only good for four years. And that tr proved not to be true. So... Super Bowl Sunday that year, I had a freak out and I had to drop like three classes because it was just way too much and that really sucked. Um, but it was fine. I got through it. So then I finished my chemistry degree and I got a master's degree as well from the University of Arizona. 
And at that point, I went to the PhD program at the University of Illinois, um, which is really a fantastic institution. U of I, Northwestern, you know, you think about Wisconsin. The Midwest has some fantastic uh, universities for engineering. And I spent five years there. Um, what I did at the U of I is sort of not what you would think of for chemical engineers. So if you were to, you know, be able to Google image search, you know, stereotypical chemical engineering or something like that, what would come up are these huge um, petroleum refineries, right? That sort of large scale industrial chemistry. Um, and what I did as a PhD student was I worked with small scale chemistry. So imagine a business card where instead of having pipes, you have little tubes that are the size of a human hair. So now you're doing chemistry at you know a billion times smaller than your coffee cup. And so that's that's what I did. It was fun. I got to make stuff in the lab. It was a lot of building things. Um, and I came out of grad school feeling like I knew how to make tools. I could make microfluidic tools, but I didn't have a good science question that I liked. And I wanted to be a professor because I like research and teaching. Um, and so then I did some more time as a researcher. We do what's called a postdoctoral study, so after you get your PhD. And I started at the University of California, Berkeley, and I missed one really terrible winter in Illinois. And then my lab actually moved from Berkeley to the University of Chicago, which is on the south side of Chicago. And I was there um, for another three years. Um, so after that, I started as a professor in Massachusetts in 2014, and I've been here ever since. So just so I have the timeline right, was it five years for undergrad and then two five years? Five years for undergrad, two more years for uh, master's, and then about five years for a PhD. So five plus two plus five. Now, I'm not really good at math, but that's 12 years. Is that right? Something like that. One of my buddies, when she graduated, when she got her PhD, had a cake that said, you know, happy graduating from the 24th grade. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, I was definitely right. on the long, long term plan when I was trying to go through my undergrad. It took me forever to get through it. But, uh, you know, I is it in your experience, is it pretty typical for people that are going through um, graduate and PhD programs to take that long? Yeah, so not everybody gets a master's degree, so that's something different in my case. But yeah, the average time to get a PhD is four and a half to five years. The average time to get a master's degree is probably 18 months to three years, depending on whether you're doing classes or research or both. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, here's a good question. I think I know which one you're going to tell me, but I'm not sure. What was the hardest class that you took in undergrad? So I have a lot of students that are going to be taking chemistry in college. What was your hardest chemistry class that you took? I'm really bad at organic chemistry. Yes, I've told them that too. Organic chemistry is so hard. Yeah, so organic chemistry is all about, like, if you use it all the time, it's fine. I think it's kind of like learning a foreign language, right? If you have somebody to practice with and you kind of use it all the time, then it's fine. But I didn't have a reason to use it. So I don't normally make flashcards for most classes, and I have a stack of flashcards. And I worked my butt off for that class, and I am perfectly satisfied with the grade I got, which was not an A. And that's fine. I got, I got a C. <laughs> yeah. What did you get? I got a B, yeah, but I it was dreadful. Did. Okay. It was dreadful. Um, I had a student, um, Danasia wants to know, um, I have actually a couple students that are looking at um, careers in law enforcement or yeah. uh, law in general, um, do they need chemistry in college from what you know of? All right. I was thinking maybe like some kind of forensics where they look at chemistry, but do you um, have any input on that or do you know? Well, so I think that you could always take something that would be informative. And so understanding how like forensic analysis is done, et cetera. But I think most universities require, it's this idea of being well-rounded, right? So if you wanted to be a science major, then you're like, oh, man, I have to take these history courses and these political science courses or whatever. That's the well-rounded side. Whereas if it's the other side, right, if you want to major in politics, communications, uh, sociology, right, then the well-rounded side of things is more the science and the math. And so I think most people have to take at least general chemistry. 
and from my experience at least general chemistry in high school isn't that much different from the general chemistry that you would take in college so having taken Correct. having taken chemistry in college or in high school i think you're going to have an easy transition to chemistry in college yeah the yeah the content is going to be pretty similar the difference would be what kind of lab experience you had like i had really terrible labs when i was in high school and so then i got to learn a lot more about that in college so just for this, my students that are watching, like I know we haven't had a, a lot of opportunities to do lab stuff and, you know, there's a possibility the end of our year may get kind of screwed up with what's going on. But um, I can tell you from my experience going through undergrad, um, we did a lot more labs and there was a lot more lab write-ups in, in chemistry in college. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on, what was your favorite class that you took in college? It doesn't have to be chemistry, just in general, what was your favorite class? Well, I had a really good time with Japanese pop culture. Um, so my friends and I all watched a lot of Japanese animation when we were in college. And so we were taking this course as an elective and we ended up helping teach it at one point because we definitely knew a lot more about it than that guy did. That was a lot of fun. That's cool. So it's not all chemistry. It's not all hard classes in college. Sometimes you got to take some stuff and it gives you an opportunity to kind of explore things that you're interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, so attending school, other than the, 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 the freak out that you mentioned, uh, that Super Bowl Sunday, did you have any other hardships that you experienced going through college? Uh, moving around a little bit probably didn't make it easy, right? Yeah, the moving around is hard and the making friends is hard, right? Because if you think about it, you grow up, if you grow up in one place, you go to school, you know, from elementary school, junior high, high school, you know all these people, you have all these friends. And so I chose to go out of state for college and I basically had to start over. And whereas, you know, some of the people who were there had people they knew from uh, high school. Um, but I actually ended up being roommates with somebody who was a sophomore. She was a year older than me. And so I kind of slipped into her friend group. So we weren't all starting from zero, but that was nice. Um, but in general, I think I had this problem more in graduate school, but I see it happening in undergrad a lot with the students I teach is that people really, really stress about performance and that, you know, everything has to be perfect and am I doing enough and, and th that sort of thing. And they work themselves into being unhappy. And I've seen, it's, you know, we're working on it, but there's an increasing awareness of mental health um, that, and resilience, teaching students how to be resilient, that it's not about getting the right answer, it's about how do you address the situation. Uh, and that's increasing. Um, but that's definitely something you see in, I think, across all majors. Um, but it, we see it in our major, too. I'm really glad that you brought that up. I think a lot of kids, especially in high school, get so focused on performance and grades. And yeah. it, I mean, who cares? All right? right. I mean, your GPA is kind of important, but it's not like life ending if you have, uh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, just got to get through the material. That's important. Yeah. And some of the other things you do are really more important than, you know, whether you get all the points on the exam. So when I was a, a student at U of I, I had, there was an undergraduate who joined the program and he had taken a couple years of class at the community college. He was from a tiny little town in central Illinois and he had a really rough time coming to the big university. Um, and his grades were kind of meh, right? But he got it all organized. His grades went up over time. He was never a stellar student in the classroom, but this guy was amazing in the lab. He could build anything. He was super creative. He never had, you know, any fear about trying something. Oh, well, let's try this. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, I'm going to modify it this way. And that kind of, you know, experience and ability is much, much more important than your grades. Like when I'm looking to, to hire an undergraduate to work in my lab, I'm not super worried about what your grades are. I mean, if, if you have like a 1.5 GPA, okay, we got to talk, right? But I'm much more interested in, you know, are you excited? Are you willing to go in there and just try stuff out? And I don't think that we put enough emphasis as a society on those types of skills that it's all about what's your number. Yeah, I, I 
definitely agree with you there. Um, just being able to get in there and try stuff. And we've definitely in chemistry because I feel like chemistry is definitely one of those subjects where it's overwhelming for a lot of a lot of kids. Yep. Chemistry mm-hmm. and math where they're just so overwhelmed and they just come in with just the worst attitude some days. And mm-hmm. we've definitely had this conversation a couple of times that it's all about attitude when you go in there. If you have a good attitude, you can you'd be surprised what you can do. But if you have this just terrible attitude and you go in, life's just going to be awful and class is going to be miserable for you. Well, and I saw a really nice, you know, sort of, you know, meme slash, you know, gif thing online at one point where this one per this little stick figure was like, oh, you're so good at math. This is amazing. And then the other one's like, nah, dude, I just had to practice. Oh, you were born with this. Well, no, no, no. It's just practice. And that's really all it is. It's a lot of practice. I just had a, one of my students just chimed in. Chemistry is hard. And then they typed in AF. And I'm sure you know yes. what that means. So, yes, chemistry can disagree. be challenging. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. there you go. There's a PhD in chemistry, and she's telling you that chemistry can be difficult. Oh, yeah. But I don't have to know everything, right? I, I have a degree in chemistry. I don't remember most of it. That's fine. I have a, a person who works in my lab who is a can brilliant chemist. Can you say chemist. that one more time? Like, you have a degree in chemistry, but you don't remember most of it? Yeah. I have a degree in chemistry, and I don't remember most of it, right? Because I don't use it on a regular basis. Yeah. I remember what I use. And if I had to go do organic chemistry, I'd go remember it eventually. I got a textbook for it. Um, I have another question. I'm going to try to read this. It says, what advice would you give to students who have an interest in big D1 university for science but are not confident in their ability? I think the thing that is most intimidating about like a big D1 university is the size and this feeling that you're one person in a thousand and that the professor will never care about you, interact with you, whatever. And I'm not going to say that all professors do care. That's not true. There's jerks everywhere. But don't be afraid to advocate for yourself, right? Maybe you don't like me as a person or my style or the way that I answer questions. Right? That's why I have a dozen other people that you can go and talk to, and maybe you'll connect with them. Right? Get a group, study group, right? Strengthen numbers. Um, so a lot of this is about, you know, you can, you can ver- really shrink that size of a D1 university like Illinois that's, what, 35,000 people? Really small if you build that little community around yourself. So when I uh, when I started going to school, I was at a small community college, and I was afraid to go to a big university uh, like NIU, just because again it's a giant place and you're just a tiny little person. Mm-hmm. Um, so once I got there and realized, and again I had a kind of small group of friends. Once I had that small group of friends, it definitely took the uh, intimidating nature of the school uh, away a little bit. Um, and there's mechanisms that we've had in that we have in place, especially at big universities. So UMass has peer mentors that you get connected with when you go through orientation. You know, hey, here's this person and, you know, who you can interact with. There's always a smaller freshman level class to kind of get you into a group to start with, just give you opportunities. Um, But, yeah, just go for it. Go for it. Um, I don't know. So Caesar asked this question, and this might be tricky for you to answer because you teach at the graduate level but he says how much time do you believe your average student spends studying and doing assignments during the week so the goal in theory and i know that there are some classes in my department that this is not true for okay is that if it is a three credit course right so that means that we meet somewhere that you know three hours a week. Okay, so let me rephrase. If a student is taking a three-credit course, the assumption is that that should take about three hours of work per credit. That includes going to class, et cetera. So my assumption is that if I I meet three times a week, that's like four hours. We're a little bit more than an hour per time we meet, that they should then spend about five or six hours on the homework. Now, not every class is that that is true for. I know that one of our senior classes is really bad. Um, where I think this becomes a problem is if people don't manage their time, right? So then they don't spend enough time on homework, and then all of a sudden it just consumes their life when the deadline comes or when the exam comes. 
Yeah, I've heard that number before, um, but yeah. it varies. Because, like, at it the does. beginning of the semester, when you don't have a lot going on, it can be pretty easy. But then it at is. the end of the semester, it can be overwhelming, especially if you wait on stuff. Yeah, things can accelerate. The advantage of, like, engineering, though, in my perspective, is that if you do the homework as you go, and if you sort of understand it, like, my test of whether or not you really understand something is if you could explain it to someone else, then that means you don't have to cram later on because you already understand it, and so you're spreading out the studying. So I'm just kind of reading the, the comments that students are writing here because we had a lab drop this week, um, which they didn't actually get to do the lab. So the last day that I was there, I recorded the lab and kind of walked them through it, and I've been doing it in kind of chunks, and they're complaining. <laughs> they're complaining about how much work they had to do in the lab, and I'm like, you guys have no idea. Like, when you get into college, like, this is what you're going to have to do, and there's no support sometimes. Um, so, Yeah. Good luck to you guys. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's see. Uh, I've got, let's see. What advice would you have for someone that is considering chemistry as a career? I would ask the question more of like, okay, so you like chemistry. What does that actually mean in terms of what your career looks like? You know, do you want to be a chemist who's coming up with new drug molecules at a pharmaceutical company? Right? Do you want to be somebody who does analysis in a forensics lab? Right? Depending on the job that you're interested in, you may need more than just an undergraduate degree, and you should sort of plan accordingly. Similarly, if you think you want to like make gigantic amounts of stuff, I would say you probably don't want to be a chemist. You want to be a chemical engineer. And vice versa. Right? If you think that a chemical engineer is going to be doing all kinds of fancy new chemistry, you should go be a chemist. All right. Um, let me try to got a lot of questions coming in right now. So, uh, would a final exam in a chem class include a lab portion? If it does, uh, would it be alone or with assistance? I think what that means is like, would you be just given the lab and you have to do it by yourself, or would there be someone there to help you, like a TA? I don't think that we have final exams, lab final exams. I didn't, but that was quite some time ago. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they just have written exams. And certainly, even for our chemical engineering lab courses, we don't have that kind of hands-on lab exam. So when I took organic chemistry, we had a separate lecture class, and then we had mm -hmm. a lab class. And for the lab class, mm -hmm. I do remember us having a final exam, and it was okay. written for the lab class, but it wasn't that I like could a practical, lab practical. Right. Yeah, there might be something related to what you did in the lab, but it would be written not like go you know, mix chemicals. All right. Uh, so moving on to chemistry. Um, so like what made you really decide to move towards teaching instead of working in the private sector? Like I know earlier you mentioned that you did some research and that kind of got you into teaching, but like why teaching specifically? I'm just curious maybe if Taekwondo had anything to do with that. Yeah. So I've done a lot of teaching in my life. I did Girl Scouts all through junior high and high school, and I did tons of tutoring and that sort of thing. And I ran the Taekwondo club at the University of Arizona for most of my time there. So I've done a lot of teaching. Um, the reason that I wanted to go into academia rather than industry, though, was more about what else I would get to do. Because you could imagine you'll do some sort of teaching, you know, in a company. Um, but I did three internships when I was in undergrad. So the first one, my dad's a, a design engineer. He's an electrical engineer and designed really fancy industrial buildings. So like the, the fabs where Intel builds their chips, right? So you can imagine that that's much more complicated than building like a school because you have to have it be ultra clean. You have nasty chemicals. You know, there, there's a lot going on there. Um, and I hated that. It, designing buildings and designing processes was just not what I wanted to do. So that was something that I, you know, check that one off the list. The next summer I worked for Intel um, in their sort of support facilities. So under every single manufacturing floor that you have, there's a support team that supplies all of the chemicals, the water, takes care of the waste. And again, it was fine, but not particularly exciting. And my last one was a research and development internship with Micron Technologies in Boise, Idaho. And there I was given a problem and said, you know, told to go figure it out. And I thought that that was fun. 
But ultimately, I decided that if I had an idea that didn't match the sort of trajectory of the company, that I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, that what I would be interested in would be limited by the company's you know, trajectory. That's why I decided to, to go into academia. So I could couple teaching with I could do research on whatever I could convince somebody to give me money to do. And so it was a much broader, more free um, opportunity than working for a company. So even w with research, what flexibility do you have? I mean, do you just say, oh, I'm going to go make this or do this? Do you have any does – the, does the school that you work for limit the scope of your research? Whatever I can get grant money or support for. So I have a couple students who work on microfluidic devices. And we collaborate a lot with different companies, manufacturing things, helping out pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. It's entirely based on what I can bring in. So if I decided all of a sudden, so I work on microfluidic devices and I work on bio-inspired materials. Basically, my, my big dream for that is could I make a vaccine or a, a, a biological therapeutic? So if anybody's seen ads for Enbrel or Humira, these are a lot of... Um, protein-based drugs, and they have to be kept refrigerated. So if you have a shipment coming in, you have to be home to meet it. If you want to travel, you have to figure out how you can keep your medicine cold for the drive across Kansas or the flight to Europe. You know, it really limits your quality of life. And so if we could figure out a way to keep those drugs so that they would be stable and you could just throw it in your purse and call it a day, that would have a big impact. But if I decided tomorrow not to do that and do hydrogen fuel cells instead, that's fine as long as I can pay my students. That's really cool. <clears throat> I had a student that asked, um, how do you deal with time management? Because, uh, you know, when you get into college classes, there's a lot going on and it's really hard to manage your time. It's a lot. Um, the big thing is that once you're behind, it's hard to get caught up again, right? So it, I always tried to do my homework right away, start it right away, so that if I had questions, I could go to office hours, get it figured out, and not be scrambling at the end. Um, and I would also say to not be afraid to advocate on your behalf. So we had um, our juniors in the fall semester have three big chemical engineering courses, and they kept ending up with all of their exams, like one right on top of the other. And so they went to the faculty and complained, and they're like, dude, why don't you talk to each other? We're going to do terrible. And so now the faculty spread out the exams. Um, but yeah, you do have to just be on top of things. I kept a calendar. Yeah, I, I do a calendar. It's the same thing. Um, it's really hard to stay organized sometimes, even with a calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I warned you about this question. Um, why do your students or just students in general dread chemistry or hate chemistry? Because I get that a lot from my students, and I don't really have, I don't really have a good answer for them. I think it's two things. One is I think that society has told them that it's going to suck and that it's not cool, etc. And I think part of it is that science, I mean, math in particular, right, because you do math for a lot longer coming up to the sciences, isn't done in a way that makes it seem meaningful, right? Like, why do I care which of the balls going down the ramp wins, right? Or why do I care about doing a proof in geometry about, you know, it's not relevant to everyday life. So, you know, I think getting in there and being able to do things. Labs actually make it a lot better because you're doing it for real. And if you can make those examples be relevant, it helps. Um, but I think we sort of decided as a society, and I'm sure that this was true in undergrad for physics, that you had to understand the fundamental principles and the beauty of the science or something rather than just how it was useful. Yeah, when we and, uh, yeah. it's a lot of hard stuff, but then once you get in the lab and you actually get to see things, you're like, oh, this yeah. is this is actually pretty cool. Yeah, so there's a lot of effort to try and translate things and get you to get out there and experience it. Um, but I think that's why, is that you do have to kind of like, on faith, say, okay, it'll be better if I get through this, and go from there. I think seeing the application is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just funny because uh, the last couple labs that we've done, we've been working with, um, you know, acids where you have to wear splash goggles and gloves. And the students are like, oh, this is stupid because I got to be safe. And now who's laughing? Coronavirus, right? Now you wish you had all that stuff. 
I had a friend who had acid splashed in her face in high school. That stuff's important. So there you go. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't know. Like, I, you and I talked about this before we started, where we we're kind of checking out. But maybe, uh, like, what classes are you actually teaching right now um, in chemistry? So I teach our Introduction to Chemical Engineering course, which if you look at the name, right, in college, the classes are numbered based on the department that offers them. Mine is offered at the college level, so it is Engineering 110, Introduction to Chemical Engineering. And then I teach an Engineering 530, or Chemical Engineering 535, which is Microfluidics and Microscale Analysis. Uh, so, so what is microfluidics? Mm-hmm. So... Um, basically think of taking a pipe and making it the size of a human hair. And then why you say, well, why would that be useful? Okay. Well, if you imagine you go, you know, to Dunkin' or uh, Starbucks or whatever, and you put creamer in your coffee and you see it swirl around and I say, okay, do it exactly like that again. You can't. And a lot of chemical reactions are very sensitive to concentration. And so this is a problem that you can get variability based on this. If you go to very, very small length scales or very viscous materials, so if you want to try this at home, you can do this with like honey and like you know, jelly, um, that you can swirl it and it'll just sit there and look at you, right? Whereas if you did this in water, it just disperses really quickly. But you can get what's called laminar flow. So imagine you have different colored streams coming together and they're flowing and then you put them all in one channel and then they just keep going in a straight line. Now I can do chemistry right at that interface. I could have this side be hot and this side be cold. This an acid, this a base. And I could just have chemistry happen right here. And so there's a lot of really cool things that we could do with tiny amounts of reagents in a way that you couldn't do it at the larger scale. Um, and I don't know if anybody has ever, if I ask, has anybody ever heard of a microfluidic device? You probably have, right? So the best known examples of this, I'm talking about little pipes, but if you think about flow through paper, right, the little fibers in paper, that size is like that same length scale. Um, so things like a pregnancy test, uh, glucose test strips for diabetes, these are all examples of microfluidic devices where you have a series of chemical steps that occur that you don't see in the device and that gives you a readout in this case related to your health. And so I teach a class that gives people the basics on this and then I have projects that are brought in by companies. So I have big companies like 3M, you know, that makes sticky notes, different labs on campus, different labs from around the world. I always have a project sponsored by somebody in Australia to make a device that answers a scientific problem in that lab that that lab will then go and use later on for all of their experiments. And so they actually get to build these. And we don't necessarily do it with heavy duty chemicals, maybe if they're really successful, but you can test a lot of things with food coloring. And so we, you know, have a great time doing these kinds of, of activities. Um, that's, that's really cool. I've heard uh, the laminar flow before, but I had no idea what that was until you explained it. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, I'm trying to hit some of these other questions. I know we're getting short on time here. Uh, no one wants to know, and I don't know if you can actually even answer this question. Who wants to know if you've ever been to Area 51? I have not been to Area 51, but my parents drove through at one point, I think, and brought me back alien toilet paper. There you go, Nolan. Um, let's see. Caesar if anybody's, like oh, sorry, I was going to say, if anybody's interested, I just uh, texted you a link um, so uh, on your it, chat here for down. my students write an online textbook on microfluidics. So that's a link to our online textbook. All right, I just put it in our chat here. Um, Caesar would like to know what factors do you consider when you're preparing your course materials? Are you constrained? I mean, you're probably constrained by some sort of curriculum, but do you get any flexibility or do you get to scaffold things your way? Yeah, so I'm constrained in terms of what I need to cover in terms of having the course be accredited, right? So for a degree to be meaningful, it's, it's usually an accredited program. In our case, it's run by ABET, which is the Accreditation Board of Engineering Technologies or something, I don't know. Um, so I have to hit certain topics, but how I choose to do that is entirely up to me. I could do it in any order. I could get up there and lecture at you till you all fall asleep. I could design group activities, anything like that. My kids love it when I just talk at them for the whole period. They love that. Oh, it's great, yeah. Yeah, they absolutely love it. 
Yeah, so I try very hard not to lecture much. Um, I try and have group activities and problems and work with each other and get it to be as in interactive as possible. So are you in a classroom setting? Because a lot of chemistry classes in college are just these big lecture halls. Are you in, yep. at your level, are you in a classroom setting where you have that ability to do small groups or is it still a big lecture hall? Oh, no, I'm still in a big lecture hall and we just make it work. Oh, well, that's cool. Most teachers yeah. wouldn't even try that, so good yeah. for you. Yeah, turn to the person next to you, have a conversation. Um, have you always been teaching at the graduate level or um, do you have you taught any of the other like undergrad classes? So I teach one and one. Uh, when I was a PhD student, though, most PhD students will help teach courses. And when I was a PhD student, I was a teaching assistant for undergraduate courses, you know, sophomore level courses. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, let's see here. I was, try I was trying to make sense of some of the stuff on your page that you um, you sent to me earlier, your uh, your department page or your bio yeah. page, I guess you want to call it. What is a macro or bio macro molecule? Yeah. Okay, so we're just putting uh, either Greek or Latin words together because it sounds good. Because when in doubt, do that. So we all know what molecules are. A macro molecule is a big molecule. So this could be a polymer. It could be a protein. It could be DNA. It could be a polysaccharide. Um, and then the fact that it's bio means that it's biological. And so I work with proteins, DNA, polysaccharides, that kind of thing. Viruses. There you go. So you didn't just make that word up. Nope. I, I like to use big words. Sometimes it makes me sound cool. I'll have to use that mm -hmm. one in class when we get back. Um, so I know your research revolves around chemistry, biology, and engineering, which is really cool because you're like a master of everything. Um, so does anything that you're doing right now relate to the coronavirus? Like you talked about pregnancy test kits and, um, there was another tester that you mentioned. Does yeah, any of the work diabetes, that you do yeah. now have anything to do with the test kits that they're trying, they're trying to develop? So we're not working on that, but one of the things we are working on is trying to make vaccines that are temperature stable. So a lot of times when people make vaccines, they'll take a virus and they'll grow it up and then they'll sort of, you know, kill it a little bit so that it's sort of dead, but not really dead. And then they'll inject that into a person in order to get an, an immune response. But the vaccines for measles and for yellow fever and some other examples are really temperature sensitive. Like it'll die if you look at it wrong. And so what we're trying to do is figure out ways of making those formulations more stable so that you can just leave it sitting on a shelf for years. Or if a disaster happens, earthquake in Haiti, and you need to fly down there with a bunch of tetanus vaccine or what you know, whatever you need, that you can just put it in a suitcase and go. You don't have to figure out how do you carry buckets of ice. Um, so that's sort of a longer term thing, um, but we're not on the front lines of sort of the more biological research. We're kind of downstream of that. But we do work with viruses, and um, we'll be writing up a paper. I had a student who finished her PhD on Wednesday who was leading this project, and we were able to stabilize um, a particular type of virus um, that's similar to uh, human papillomavirus, which causes um, uh, um, cervical cancer. There we go, cervical cancer. Um, and we could, we could stabilize it significantly for weeks or months at 60 degrees Celsius, right? So hotter than going to Phoenix in the summer. So it's important to make sure that those vaccines are able to, I guess that would, that would be a game changer, I guess, for us, right? If those vaccines could last longer. Well, and it's also a huge cost. So somewhere between 70 and 80% of the cost of a vaccine has to do with the logistics and the fact that if something happens, right, if the truck breaks down, the air conditioning dies, you don't know how long that that um, vaccine has been warm and if it's still good. So are you willing to take the chance? No, right? We just throw them away. And we throw away half of vaccines that are manufactured every year because something happened. And so this would really save a lot of money, save a lot of energy, right? This would be good for the environment. We're not making and wasting as much. We don't need the energy for refrigeration. All of these things. Um, trying to get through the last of these questions here. Um, let's see. <laughs> I, 
of course you're going to say yes to this. It says, um, do you recommend taking science classes in college? I do. Um, but I mean, if you're not going to be a science major, take a science class that you're interested in. Right? Don't just take like it physics. because you hate it. Physics can be a lot of fun. You got to have a physics teacher a who's fun. fun, though. Right. Yes. Uh, like me, right? Everybody loves taking physics from me. They do. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, would you consider analyzing data or information of strength, and how so? Yes. So it's one thing to be able to do an experiment, right? And that takes a certain set of skills and designing the experiment. But ultimately, that part of it is meaningless unless you can then interpret your results. So figuring out how do you analyze data, whether that's you know, using software, Excel, or uh, other computer software, we use MATLAB, and then thinking of the ways of doing it to extract something that isn't obvious. That's critical. Data analysis is a huge, hugely critical part of doing science. So all the, when we post lab a, uh, a lab and you guys have to do your calculations, that's just as important as doing the lab itself. Well, and imagine if you didn't have the instructions, right? How would you figure out how to design an experiment that would answer a specific question? And how would you analyze that data out, right? Think about Newton, you know, the story of him getting bonked on the head by an apple. Okay, great. But then he had to go and prove it and do the math around it. That's the cool part, not just getting That's bonked on the head part. by an apple. Yep. Uh, yeah. Omar would like to know, are there any cool jobs out there uh, in chemistry? I'm sure you know tons of them, like being a college professor, right? But like, what are some other jobs that you think are, you personally think are really cool in mm -hmm. chemistry? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the application. So my department head, the person in charge of my department, worked at Dow Chemical for years. And he gave a lecture when he interviewed that made watching paint dry interesting. And you think, oh my gosh, how could wall paint be exciting? Well, he talked about ways of incorporating different types of chemistry so that you would paint it on the wall, but maybe we think about indoor air pollution, right? Maybe it could take organic molecules that are toxic that come out of, say, a new mattress and just suck them up and degrade them, right? That would be a really cool application. Um, different ways of f food. Food is a huge area where chemistry comes in. Um, I mean, I'm not an advocate of fat-free salad dressing. I think it's gross. But think about the technology. How did you pull fat out of something and then combine materials around in a way that sort of had it feel like it had that texture? Or how could you have different, say, ranch dressing that you eat with your carrots and that helps you, your body absorb the, the nutrients that are good for you in the carrots? Our bodies are bad at that, right? That would be a really cool thing. So I think there's a lot of applications out there, and then it's a question of what the job title specifically is. I'm never going to look at salad dressing the same again now. <laughs> um, Nolan would like to know who your favorite scientist is. <sighs> so when I was a kid, I really, really admired these volcanologists. They were on a National Geographic video that I watched over and over again. Their names were Maurice and Katya Kraft. Um, but the people that I really like nowadays, uh, there's a, a physics professor um, at Harvard who does some just amazing stuff where she looks at, at living systems, sea urchins or anemones, and figures out how to make materials that mimic that behavior. And so her name is Joanna Eisenberg, and she's just really cool. She's one of my science heroes. But yeah, I love people who can just take a vision and turn it into something. All right. So uh, we got just a couple minutes left. If you guys can think of any last minute questions, uh, please type them in the chat. Uh, I'd like to know what the um, most difficult part of your job is as a professor. The most difficult part of my job is probably managing people, right? And you don't think of that because, you know, say I do science, right? But I run a research group. I have six PhD students who work in my lab, and they're each individuals. And the way that one of them deals with challenges is different than another. And then I have, I mean, just think about this last week, right? We shut down from the university, and I had students who worked in my lab not knowing if they were going to be able to come back, 
trying to decide if it was safer for them to stay in their apartment at Amherst or go home to the Boston area where there's a lot of coronavirus, right? There's a lot of human interactions that I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's not what I'm an expert in, right? But you just have to take the time, listen to people, try and figure out what's best for each individual person. Um, what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? Watching people succeed. Definitely. No teacher wants to watch a kid fail. They think, no. that, they think that we're out to get them, but we want everybody to be successful. No. I mean, when people get into grad school or get a job or get an internship, whatever that thing is that they're working towards, that's fantastic. And that's one of the things I'm really sad about commencement is, you know, I go to commencement for the students. It's their celebration, and I like being there with them. Yeah, it's going to be sad if graduation doesn't happen at our school at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully things calm down to where we can at least go back, but uh, yeah, I know there's a lot of rumors out there right now where we won't go back, and uh, unfortunately there's so much up in the air right now, nobody knows anything. Yeah, ours has officially been at least postponed, if not canceled. Yeah, that stinks. Yeah. Um, let's see. What, is there anything you want to ask us? Any questions you have for them? Who's your favorite chemistry teacher? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, How many times? It's a love-hate yes. relationship, I think. Uh huh. Well, I already figured out why it is you don't have hair. We saw that video. Yeah, they. Yeah, I almost burned the school down. That was great. Yeah. I showed her the video of the uh, the thing. That, yeah. What was it? The whoosh bottle. I think I showed all my classes mm -hmm. that. But how I almost. Well, it, it wasn't my fault. It totally wasn't my fault. They gave me an old bottle, and it was just bad news. So it wasn't my fault. <laughs> I've only dealt with three fires so far. None of them as exciting oh, as yours. That's, wow, really? I'm honored. Oh, yeah. Uh, Nolan has a really obscure question for you. I don't know if yeah. you can answer it in like 60 seconds, but he says, I heard Venice waters are clearing up due to human absence. What is the science behind this? I think it has to do with the turbulence of all of the boats, right? So whether they're motorized or if they're the, the pole you know, gondolas, every time you do that, you're going to stir up sediment in the bottom layer. And it's just going to be cloudy, and it takes a while for it to settle down. So I think that's all it is. I am super impressed that you were able to answer that like that. Man, you should be teaching chemistry at, <laughs> at our school. They would probably they're supposed to be over you. Well, and they're saying there's dolphins now. I didn't know you had dolphins near Italy, but they've got them in the Venice uh, canals. So There you go. Hopefully that was an acceptable answer. So uh, we are out of time. i got to wrap things up here, but uh, would you mind if I gave them your like official email address if they have questions? Could they reach out to you? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, not a problem. All right. Well, we definitely appreciate having you this afternoon. Uh, we hope everything is, works out in uh, the Massachusetts area. You don't have anything crazy going on out there. Hopefully everything is mm -hmm. nice and calm, and we, we get through this together. And uh, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Cool. All right. Thank you, Mr. Zorn. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All right. Take care. We'll see everybody. Have a great spring break, and we'll see you.